Jeremy, welcome. Thanks for being here. Super excited to, to chat and, and hear about all the cool stuff that you're working on. You want to give us just a really, really short intro for folks who perhaps haven't heard of you? Sure. My name is Jeremy Howard. Uh, I am I just uh, co-founded a R&D lab called Answer.ai with uh, Eric Rees. We're focused on trying to maximize the societal benefits of artificial intelligence through creating applications that help help people with their lives. Um, before that, I've been involved in a number of AI and machine learning startups, um, co-founding um, Fast AI, founding Analytic, Kaggle, various others. So yeah, my, very interested in AI and machine learning, in creating organizations to help capture the potential of those things. I've been a, a big fan of everything that you've been doing with Fast AI for a very long time. I think that was originally how we were connected. You had also said a bunch of incredibly nice things, generous things about the Julia programming language, uh, which we had, we had connected over in the past. I'm curious the conviction behind wanting to make something new and, and sort of take this foray with, with answer.ai versus all the work that you were doing with fast, AI, fast AI and sort of where the breakdown is between the two. Like, is there any crossover between these initiatives or like everything with answer AI is like completely separate, completely new. Answer AI in some ways is fast AI grown up. I felt like it needed to grow up, you know, partly from a kind of an admiration for everything that open AI has achieved and a, and a recognition that that has changed the era that we're in. Fast AI was created for a different era, you know, and really the mission hasn't changed. You know, the mission that Rachel and I created Fast AI for was to make artificial intelligence more accessible. I would say that's a pretty reasonable description of Answer AI's mission as well, although we haven't stated it quite that directly. I mean, there's much bigger opportunities now, for one thing. So Rachel and I were disappointed that we were limited by our ability to make AI more accessible in that it, using AI just required quite a bit of coding background, for example. So I've always expressed that as like a sign of our ultimate failure to achieve what we really wanted to do is that we only made it more accessible to people who could code pretty well. Now you don't need to be able to code much, if at all, you know, um, because we have these great coding helpers that can either do it for you or do a lot of it for you, whatever. So it feels like that mission that more accessible, it can be much more accessible. Um, but it's, so it's not just about like practical deep learning for coders anymore basically. And so, but it's also that we're not seeing other folks step in at the point where kind of open AI's mission kind of finishes, right? So open AI's mission has always been like create AGI, you know, create a positive incarnation of AGI. Open AI provides foundation models. Okay, great. That, that is great. But then what, what do you do with them? What are they good for? And so the world's discovered a couple of places they're good for. One is coding, which we found through, through Codex, which I think was originally a GPT-3 kind of outreach. And then the second was, you know, the second is chatbots, which from the story that's been told was kind of an accidental discovery uh, at OpenAI of like, oh, let's throw this over the fence and maybe a couple of people will find it useful. Everybody was like, oh, actually we all find it's useful. Okay, so there's two things which we've discovered what are the other hundred thousand things? So that's what we want to figure out, you know, and then for like a lot of those things, there'll be constraints that don't quite make them work right. And so then it's like, okay, what, how do we make them work right? So it's development inspired research, you know, and then, and research inspired development. So it's this kind of circle. So, you know, we've actually been chatting a bit to the open AI applied research team, because that's kind of the closest group there to what we're doing. But, you know, they take quite a different approach to it, which is largely kind of client led, you know, which is it's quite a smart approach as well, which is like have, having big companies say like, oh yeah, we'll give you millions of dollars to do a custom GPT consulting project, which is not bad. I mean, there's been successful applied research companies, uh, labs in history that have used that approach, but I'm more excited by the approach where, where a lab does it, does that bit themselves, does the curation, does the development, just figures out like, 
okay, we're just spending a lot of time studying what AI is good for. And we're doing lots of experiments to see what it's good for. And then we'll build stuff based on what we think it's good for and learn by doing that dozens and dozens of times. Jeremy, from a business standpoint, you talk about kind of fast AI going to answer AI and answer AI kind of being, you know, the, the older sibling, sister or brother. You know, is there a business strategy behind making two separate entities rather than trying to grow or have answer AI be a subset of fast AI um, or any, you know, processes that you took into consideration when kind of thinking about doing that? What happened was Decibel who were our first investors were kind enough to offer, you know, I basically described the vision I just described to you, you know, of what I wanted to do. And they kindly offered to fund getting started with that. And we had a probably a 30 second discussion there with like, okay, what do we do with fast AI? And I said, it'd be much less complicated logistically if we just do nothing with fast AI, we'll just leave it. We'll create a new thing and then you don't have to worry about doing any due diligence and blah 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 so, okay cool we'll just do that so that's all there's no i mean fast ai is a very simple organization structurally you know it, it's had no expenses it's had no revenue it's basically it's just a shell thing that you know owns some ip i guess but it's like because it's entirely an altruistic venture which has never tried to make any money. Yeah, there's really not much to it. And all the stuff that you know, the IP it owns is all open source software and freely available courses and whatnot anyway. So it's, at least so far, it just hasn't been an issue, actually. Will anything end up happening to Facet AI? Like, are you intending to continue developing courses or will all future Jeremy Howard work be under the new umbrella that you've created and Facet AI will kind of live as in an archive state, but like, there's not going to be like net new developments in the space. I think somewhere in between the two, Logan. So I hope that new courses I do will reflect this new era I described and they won't just be fast AI courses. There'll be answer AI content. So yeah, if I feel a bit like if I just did another practical deep learning for coders, you know, 2024 edition, it's not responding to the fact that the world's changed, you know, and I am, and the world has changed, I am trying to respond to that fact. And it's kind of, it can be a bit paralyzing, you know, because I feel like there's so many more opportunities now. Sometimes I'm always thinking like, okay, well, what's the new era way to do a thing for all things? And that can be quite challenging. But having said that, you know, the software, the fast AI software is very popular and it's, you know, NB Dev and fast AI itself and GH API and all the other pieces. Um, and so the, I continue to coordinate the open source community on continuing to maintain and develop that software and all of that software is going to continue to be useful for answer.ai projects as well. Jeremy, just thinking about the landscape of AI too and all these courses that are rolling out, what do you caution folks or, you know, tell individuals who are looking for different courses or material to learn more about large language models or AI? I, know I mean, um, the short answer is I spend a really long time creating my courses and I think they should take them. And that's not just because I've created them. I genuinely don't know that there's a better way to get started with large language models, for example, than watching my hacker's guide to large language models video and following the recommendations that I provide. And to get deeper, I don't think there's a better way to do that than to do the faster AI course, parts one and two. Um, you know, I think the thing I notice is that people don't stick to it. So, you know, I actually encourage people to look up, there's a, there's a less well-known fast.ai lesson zero, which answers this question more deeply, but largely it's like a motivational pep talk based on like hundreds and hundreds of conversations I've had with alumni over the years. And the most successful alumni all described that the thing they did, which caused them to be successful was just was to keep going. And so if you look at the watch completion, you know, top views for the lessons of the fast AI course, popular and well-regarded machine learning and AI course, you know, they drop off, you know, very fast. And a few people stick around, you know, for the first 10 hours. And then quite often, if they get to there, they kind of finish the whole thing. And like everybody I speak to goes in with plans to stick with it, to do the assignments, you know, that if they get stuck, they're going to like look for other resources to try to help them figure out how to get unstuck. 
you know, and ChatGPT is particularly good for that now. You know, if you get stuck, there's an expert you can ask, and that's clearly from the answers is very familiar with the Fasted AI courses as well, so it can help you specifically with the courses. In the end, it is a lot of work, and it is a lot of time, and it is hard, and so you've got to figure out the trick to turning that initial enthusiasm. And the enthusiasm is like, I wish I could know that stuff. You know, the enthusiasm is very rarely for, I wish I could do all the things necessary to know the stuff. The enthusiasm is, I wish I could know that stuff. Well, the only way to know the stuff is to do all that really hard work required to get to the point that you know that stuff. So you have to somehow turn that enthusiasm into like, okay, I'm enthusiastic to spend, you know, when you've got to pick something reasonable that you can actually stick to, whatever, half an hour, an hour every day for the next 30 days. I'm going to check it off the list. I'm going to tell all my friends to ask me when they see me whether I've done today's hour, you know, all the things necessary to create the social pressure on yourself to do it. You know, and in the end, if you finished, you know, the Faster AI courses, you'll be one of very few people, you know, and the vast majority of people I know who finished those courses are now working directly in, in the AI or machine working, learning research or a field or, or an industry. So that's just the trick, you know, just do the work. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think that's great motivation too for the listeners out there. Get emails, you know, every couple of days and they're just wonderful from people all the time saying like, I spent the last year finishing those courses and you know now i've got my dream job and you know i got to go and visit this conference and meet these people who are my idols and heroes and like my life has now changed and so i've seen it happen again and again and again so i know it's possible but i know this is the tiny minority of people who actually do the work and Stick with it. I'm curious if you have any like analytics around this with Facet AI, but have you seen since the explosion of interest with AI and ChatGPT and large language models, is there like some step function in the number of students who are coming to the Facet AI courses no. and like actually completing them? No, it's, 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 it, more people are starting and less people are stopping. Like it seems to have really brought in a lot of people who want to have known this stuff, but aren't prepared to put in the work. I think they're expecting it maybe to be easier than it is, you know, that this whole stuff's all going to be magic. And I think part of the problem, Logan, is that there's this huge gap at the moment between what it takes to like create a custom GPT for example, and to create a complete, really high quality application of AI you know, to solve the problem you want to solve. And the gap involves like, so you can kind of, it, it feels really good to your psyche to be like, oh, I, I've learned to use ChatGPT. Okay, now I've learned to use a custom prompt. Okay, now I've learned to create a custom GPT with a custom prompt. Oh, okay, now I've learned to do that with some documents attached. And those steps are all like fast and easy and like they could take like an hour or something. And then you've got this like, okay, how do you go further? Okay, well, now to go further, you're going to have to understand stochastic gradient descent, and you're going to have to understand the transformers architecture, and you're going to have to understand matrix multiplication and the chain rule. Okay, it's like all this stuff. And it's like, okay, now with fast AI, we try to make that super fun and interesting because at every point you're actually building stuff. But, you know, I don't know of people in this field currently who are building really successful applications who haven't learned all of those things. So I think that's a challenge. There's this like sense of like, I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing. And then suddenly somebody's like, okay, now you have to scale that huge wall to get to the next step. And people just go like, I'm not doing that, man. <laughs> Do you think like how transfer learning was sort of a layer of abstraction on top of like training models from scratch that somehow like we'll get to a point where LLMs will sit on top of the deep learning stack in some way. You could just be like, Hey, here's the things that I care about. Here's what I'm kind of looking for. Go and train this model for me. And that way you don't need to know the nuance details or do you not think like that? I mean, that's how we've always tried to teach you, right? So fast AI was the first by years to teach deep learning from a transfer learning first perspective. And we invented the idea of transfer learning of large language models of, you know, that's the type that GPT went on to make brilliant. It really helps, you know, and that's why at the end of lesson one, you've trained a world-class model. At the end of lesson two, you've 
put it up on the web as an application. But yeah, at least for now, you have to make it fast and you have to debug it and you have, you know, there'll be, and if there's not like some custom things you have to figure out, then somebody else would have done it already anyway. So like if you're trying to solve an application somebody hasn't solved before, yeah, there's going to be stuff you have to figure out. So will it continue to get easier? Yeah, perhaps, but I wouldn't wait around for that to happen because in the meantime, you could have been educating yourself and getting a lot more expertise and then you'll be able to do a bit more than everybody else. You know, would you say that the majority of folks you speak with after completing the course, you know, do so in hopes of going to work for a large organization? Or are there a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs, people who just want to get the baseline knowledge so that they can go create their own product, their own tool, and kind of build out their own thing? I think that's something that's changed a bit, Nolan, to be honest. You know, I feel like when we started, maybe a third of folks were wanting to create a startup or something, but most were looking to like go back to the company they were working at and bring AI into it. I would say nowadays, most people are interested in creating something, you know, creating a startup, creating something new. I think maybe there's a sense of maybe that, you know, even the process of creating startups and stuff is a bit more accessible than it used to be. I mean, it is, you know, we, you know, with stuff like Stripe Atlas, even just the basic logistics of creating a startup is is dramatically easier. There's more tooling around, you know, we can, you can make some progress using kind of no code type stuff. So yeah, I think maybe people are starting to get a bit more bold. And I think that's the right approach because I haven't seen big companies almost ever be successful at kind of transforming this, themselves in significant ways to adjust to major technology changes. And I don't expect that to happen with AI either. With some exceptions, like companies that are explicitly in the middle of that, like Microsoft, of course, I mean, absolutely are, and we've got normal day-to-day -day companies. So yeah, you know, startups are actually going to be the ones that where most of the innovation is going to happen. On the, on the startup creation process, like you mentioned, I'm curious, like, what are the tactical next steps for, for answer Talk? You've, you've raised some money, you put this vision out into the world. Have you started hiring a bunch of researchers to do this? Mm -hmm. Or are you like opening an office somewhere? I'm also curious about the San Francisco to Australia tension and if, if you mm -hmm. see any uh, opportunity there. Yeah. So, so yes, we've hired people. They're not called researchers. They're called R and D. It's a big difference because the kind of people that we hire are tinkerers, you know, people like you look at, like uh, you look at them and you immediately see that their answer that they've built across all kinds of different fields and like people who just have to like they come up with ideas and they have to just turn it into something and build something and try something out. You know, a lot of researchers aren't like that, right? So these are kind of tinkerers, but also folks who have also like created significant research breakthroughs as well. And so that's the combination we look for. And there's not many people like that in the world. And so we're hoping, we're hoping to hire basically all of them, or at least all of the ones who answer AI haven't already hired. You know, we, to do that, I don't think we should try to put them all in the same geographic location. I think that's a big mistake because lots of people can't move their geographic location. So if you actually want the world's best, then the trick is to say like, okay, we're going to, we're going to get the world's best people and we're going to be the world's best at figuring out how to have them work together remotely. And I've spent a lot of the last 30 years building and working with remote teams. So I think I'm pretty good at it. And for me, I would now much rather do that and be in person. So many benefits, you know, even something simple like pair programming, when each person has their own screen and their own input devices, like it's just so much more productive. You know, last night, for example, I, I've got this crazy thing I've been trying to do, which is to make it so that you can uh, basically create like a CUDA simulator, GPU coding simulator in pure Python, so that you can debug it using, you know, pure Python tools. And then I actually it's quite fun. I use ChatGPT to then auto convert it to Z code and it does it basically perfectly. So last night when I was trying to do a shared memory thread synchronized tiling matrix multiplication. So I've kind of optimized matrix multiply in this CUDA simulator environment in Python. And it just I was struggling a bit. And it's nice because through our guy in Turkey, we worked for the like first two hours of his day and the last two hours of my day together, made quite a bit of progress. And then I went to bed and got up. He's got his PR in for the repo, fixed the bugs, added the additional features we thought. And then I took it in the morning and 
now refactoring it and cleaning it up. You know, there's just all these benefits. And the vast majority of these, like, super technically deep tinkerer types, almost all of them desperately want to work remotely because they're like, they have a lot of quirky interests, you know, and they don't want to sit at a desk all day and they want to be able to, like, organize their day how they want to, you know. So we're able to kind of, like, have an environment where, you know, these people that I just love hanging out with because they're fascinating and enthusiastic and brilliant, you know, we, we can hang out together, you know, and, and we also don't really have much in the way of like normal meetings. It's more like, I'll kind of say like, okay, I'm going to be hanging out in this Zoom channel for a while doing this coding thing. If anyone wants to, wants to join me or somebody will say like, oh, I'm going to have a first cut at this project we've been talking about. If anybody wants to do it with me, let me know and we'll do it together. You know, it's more driven by personal passion and enthusiasm and playfulness. And I think these things all work very well. It is important. Like, there's a lot of things are important. For one thing, you've got to have the right equipment, right? So, like, I, I, I tell every... So, I've got, I don't know, maybe a dozen different headsets because I've tried them all. I found the one that has the longest boom arm and that's super comfortable and it's wireless. Yeah, I tell everybody that. And I, you know, I... um I don't sit at a desk, I sit on a recliner, you know, particularly when I'm talking to people. I don't get Zoom fatigue, you know, because I'm comfortable and the people I'm talking to have great audio because we've always set it up that way. Yeah, so all these details, they matter. They matter a lot. And I think they really pay off. Yeah. How are you finding people today for Answer AI? Like, is it just like through people you know, the fast AI community, like public job forums? I'm curious what the sourcing yeah, so, is. So, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a few hundred thousand alumni and most of the best ones have risen to the top. And most of them, you know, luckily for me, feel a strong affinity to my work. So I basically, pretty much everybody I reach out to from the community and say, would you like to work for us? Says yes, straight away. So that's one good source. A second is a lot of people, it turns out, have been looking for this. So after our launch announcement, I was inundated and embarrassed. I still haven't even replied to everybody with like extremely brilliant folks who both of you would know by name saying like, I'll, I'll drop everything I'm doing to come and work with Answer AI. Because the idea of doing this like real applied, spontaneous, playful tinkering in a technology that we all believe is going to change the world is just really exciting. And knowing that you'd get to be with other people doing that, you know, I think like there are certain times in history where I think people recognize like, oh, this is the company you want to be at on day one, you know, like early days of Google, early days of OpenAI, you know, these are companies that these are legendary periods and you, everybody's like, okay, I want to, and I think people are saying like, this is, this is possibly one of those moments and we want to be there. So we've had a lot of great inbound, um, and, uh, yeah, some kind of targeted outbound to the community. So we're, we, you know, we're lucky like that. And also having, you know, having a, Eric Reese as a co-founder is also great because a lot of, you know, folks who are quite entrepreneurial and interested in AI often you know, me and Eric will be the people they've kind of followed. So they'll be like, <laughs> quite often we have these conversations like, oh, Eric, <laughs> learned everything I know about startups from you. Oh, Jeremy, know everything about, about AI from you. So it's like, this is great. <laughs> so we're kind of in a great position like that. Uh, good, good, a good team. I might add on that too. And Jeremy, one of the inspiring things I think about you when kind of doing some research prior to, you know, even hopping on this call was that, you know, you're hungry to kind of help the wider audience. You know, there's, especially in technology, you talk about a lot of the large organizations that have billions of dollars to spend on this new technology and training these individuals on this technology too. But I think the value that you see is, hey, there's so many brilliant minds out there that don't have access to this technology or, you know, don't have the resources technically currently right now to, you know, help right. advance this technology forward. Yeah, absolutely. And this thing of being fully remote is very tied into that, right? Like I'm not in diversity for the, for the sake of it, but in that like brilliant human brains are all over the world, you know, and they have all kinds of different backgrounds and, you know, I want them, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, from the very earliest days of fast AI, you know, amongst our biggest user and alumni groups were places like Lagos places like uh, Bengaluru, very, very big, you know, Lagos is one of the world's biggest cities. And so lots of brilliant brains there, which were not getting the chance to flourish. So yeah, you know, one of, in fact, I think the first guy we hired um, 
John O. Whitaker. He was from Zimbabwe, you know, uh, just not a place a lot of AI hiring happens in, but he's just about the best AI practitioner I've ever come across in my life, you know, and also like a really absolute tinkerer, you know, just loves making new things. So yeah, I think, you know, for Rachel and I, when we started Fast.ai, Nolan, you know, this was a fundamental part of like, not just our value system, but our beliefs about the world is that we will make a bigger difference if we very widely distributed across the world, rather than just being available to the, you know, few hundred people that get to go to Stanford or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we'll do everything online. It'll be free. And you know, we, I remember hearing from a guy in like our first course who asked on the forum and he said, oh yeah, hi, can anybody help me? I'm in the Ivory Coast, you know, nobody else here knows anything about AI and I don't really have access to internet regularly. So I'm trying to find this way to like download stuff on from YouTube so I can put them on CDs and then I can watch them on the library computer and, and it's like, wow, you know, these are real resource constraints, but the hustle to be somebody who in the Ivory Coast is like teaching themselves AI. It's like, these are the folks that I kind of admire, you know, and find that they often go on to do brilliant things because they've, you know, they've, 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 they've got that hustle and they've got that tenacity to, to get stuff done. Just going back to the fact that there are brilliant minds everywhere. So how do you, how do we, you know, kind of combat that issue of, you know, there are these brilliant minds, but how do we get them the right resources? You know, how do we get that city or town or village, the right resources, especially when a lot of it comes back to, to your point, you know, infrastructure or software. Uh, look, my approach is very simple and it's not optimizing this necessarily, but it's, it's uh, my approach is there are going to be people who, you know, have ways of finding us. There are going to be people who have ways of accessing what we're doing, you know, and we've, we've been super careful to make sure like all of our materials, well, that didn't exist at first, but since they've existed, we'll run on CoLab for free and we'll run on Kaggle for free, that every lesson you can fully run for free. And so we're much more like, okay, we'll let people find us. We'll put it out there. We'll let people find us. You know, we'll hope that then they help build their community or they build their friends or, you know, so I, I remember hearing from a young lady in Bangladesh. She was a, she was a teenage girl at the time and she just finished, you know, part one of our course. He said, yeah, I don't know any other women who code, let alone who are interested in AI. She emailed me and said, is that okay that I code? Is it okay for women to code? Is it okay for women to be interested in AI? You know, because I'm not sure if, like, I think it might be too weird, maybe, and I should do something else. I said, not only is it okay, it's, it's great. People, you know, then I looked at her work and I was like, no, your work's actually really quite high quality. You should keep doing it. You should keep getting better. And, you know, she ended up getting a what do they call it, fellowship or scholarship or whatever at Google Brain, you know, and she traveled from Bangladesh, wow. <laughs> Silicon Valley, got into AI research. And, you know, I think these kinds of things, you know, they, they, they do come back to that community right now, because now that community is like, oh yeah, I remember that, that lady who lives in Silicon Valley now and as everybody thinks is an AI genius, but have more, you know, of our young people learning these skills. I think communities are good at doing that. In fact, here in Queensland, you know, and I arrived here, so the capital of this state's called Brisbane, and I arrived here in Brisbane, uh, you know, a bunch of folks reached out and they said, oh, did you know we've just created a new government sponsored AI hub, you know, this fancy new building. And they said, and it came out of this lady here and this lady here set it up, initially set up the study group for the fast AI courses. And then the alumni from that study group went on to create that consulting firm and work with this company. And then they got together and they, you know, and then they, that eventually turned into a co-working space. And, and so <clears throat> it just so happened, I arrived pretty much as this AI hub was launching, you know, and so I had this whole story of how like, <laughs> you know, this thing I didn't know was happening that was where I ended up living, you know, it helped stimulate the community here. And then I met this uh, venture capitalist who had this fantastic uh, venture studio. And I was like, oh, how did that all get started? And it's like, oh, funny story. Basically, I, you know, felt, saw the fast AI course and I decided like, oh, well, this is going to let, let anybody now get good at AI. So I found like the best 
maths and science students at the local university and I offered them to pay them a year's salary to do the fast AI course and then come and hang out and do projects here and then we took the best ones and then now all the companies that we've created so I'm just like yeah all these little micro stories I don't know all the stuff that's happening in the world but I think yeah you put stuff out there and uh <laughs> I hope people will find it and hope they'll help each other. That's such a beautiful story. Yeah. We need to find a way to have a documentary or something made. LinkedIn, not, not, this isn't a plug for LinkedIn Learning, but LinkedIn Learning does these like interesting behind the scenes of how different languages and frameworks are created. So I wonder if we can, uh, if anyone from LinkedIn Learning is listening to this, let's see if we can get a fast AI one made. And I've, I've enjoyed them. I think they had one for like Rust and JavaScript and some other languages like interesting. that. So it'd be, yeah, it'd be cool to see, but I'm, I'm, sort of switching gears back to answer AI stuff. I'm curious, like what the R and D to production pipeline is going to look like, like, do you have a sense of like the, is it, you know, get a couple of small teams. And then once you kind of have something that you've been tinkering with that you think people are really going to like you, you know, start to think about how to productionize it or like, what's the philosophy behind that angle? So this is the heart of our thesis and this is the bit that maybe is too crazy and as soon as you hear it you'll think like who do you think you are jeremy it starts simple it starts with eric reese's basic idea of the minimum viable product you know this iterative approach you know the, the lean startup process so we don't spend ages curating the best possible thing we can do and have a whole lot of people work on it together and then make it perfect and whatever you know we just say like oh who wants to build Anyone got any ideas of stuff you think would be nice to have, doesn't exist, maybe people would like it? Yeah, okay, you do it. You know, spend a couple of weeks, slap something together, and we'll get it out there. And, you know, then let's see if people like it. And then, you know, I'm sure you have a bunch of ideas or things to improve. So, like, okay, just improve it a bit. Focus on stuff that really makes the end user experience better. So it's like, you know, so that you're proud of it, you want to use it every day, you know, you're, you're building something that you like enough that you want to use it yourself and you do use it and you know this is like how my email company fastmail came around i was like i just created the email that i wanted and then my friend said like oh could i use it too and i was like oh okay and i added them to the users table that other friends wanted it and i added a sign up button and people liked it but i just built it for myself so then here's the kind of crazy bit our hope is that if we do this lots and lots of times you know with with a bit of coordination but not really planning that these are all products and services that, you know, are applications of language models in some form or another, or incorporate language in some form or another, you know, we'll, we'll find some abstractions, we'll find some commonalities and, you know, both in the development and the deployment and the maintenance, we'll gradually build this substrate, this kind of, this, this foundation, this platform for creating and running AI powered products. And so no we won't create a team for each one you know all of the teams will be on all of the ones because actually really they'll be run by you know the real kind of power of answer ai will be the ai underneath you know that's helping us to build and run these things and so we have to keep the team really small because as soon as we respond to demand and scaling needs by adding more people we've broken our thesis you know so that's the basic idea is that we end up hopefully being the best in the world at, at creating, deploying, and maintaining valuable AI-powered applications just by doing a lot. I think you have a non, uh, a non-trivial chance of pulling this off. I think you're, you're, you're going to be very well suited to this. And also, it's interesting to hear the parallels between this idea. And I'm not sure if, how familiar you are with the company Supercell, who creates uh, like the mobile apps, like Supercell or like Clash of Clans and Clash Royale, but it's actually a very similar thesis of they have these very small teams that like sprint on developing mobile games like Clash of Clans. And once they like go and kind of put it out into the world, if it gets like the right sort of traction, they make all this investment and they try. And then if you've ever seen their games, there's a lot of, a lot of commonality between a lot of the different games. So they sort of, uh, I don't want to say pioneered the model for you, but I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of merit in this idea. And it's it's definitely not like the trivial or like the the traditional approach to building companies i think it's mm -hmm. yeah a little bit interesting
I'm just curious, Jeremy, how you see this transition with, this is completely in a different direction, but how you see this transition with fine tuning happening. And I, I think I, I saw another, your latent space podcast that you did uh, late last year. The title was, you know, the, the death of fine tuning or the end of fine tuning. I don't know if they, they took that out of context, but um, it really feels like fine tuning is like having this like renaissance moment where like everyone is talking about like the, the thing to do in AI right now is go and fine tune a large language model. And I'm curious how you, how you feel about that, how you think that that space is going to evolve, um, whether that's going to continue. Yeah. I mean, I think the title of that podcast was intentionally, you know, <laughs> it was technically correct, but, uh, I think it was trying to kind of, uh, get people curious because my point is that fine tuning is dramatically underdone, not overdone. Uh, and that actually, and it's being done in the wrong way. So even though I, uh, even though I developed originally the ULM fit, you know, three step process that we now all use, I think it's not optimal. I think it should be more of a continuum. So I'm kind of fond of this idea of continuous pre-training. There isn't really a separate fine tuning stage and that we also could be much more bold in our expectation of what you can do with continuous pre-training, that you can really change the behavior of a model a whole lot, doing it for longer, doing it in a more sophisticated way. So yeah, so we're not creating any foundation models. We're, our interest is in like, what can we do with other people's foundation models? But being much more innovative about then how we use those weights, you know, to, to create something that could be very different to what we start with. So, you know, something like, you know, a GPT-4, you know, base model, that's a lot of tokens. It's a lot of compute. It's a lot of work to get that thing, right? And that thing was created so well that you can see now, even as people are explicitly trying to replicate it, they're consistently getting close-ish, but they don't get there. Right. Like there's, you can see that in that foundation model, there's a whole lot of rich kind of latent capability. And I really don't think anybody's anywhere near extracting all of the value from these, from these kinds of models, you know? So that's a big focus for AI is how we extract a lot more of that value. And double click on why like where's the conviction or the thought process behind people not extracting the most value is it like just like the applications that are being built aren't making the most use or is there like you're saying that the techniques that people are using no, fundamentally are so i mean the one very simple thing is just very few people do continuous fine continued fine pre-training for long you know people can you explain continuous fine tuning for, for people so can like you, myself continuous who... pre-training just means so rather than having three separate steps. So it's like, okay, first we train on like common crawl and stuff, and then we do instruction fine tuning, and then we do like DPO or RLHF or whatever. Instead, it's one big continuum. And over time, create increasingly curated subsets of higher quality tokens and of tokens that are closer and closer to the kind of domain or type that you actually want to be using in your model. And you do it in a way where you're taking advantage of, of, of techniques which are explicitly designed to keeping that model as flexible as possible and as kind of well behaved as possible, you know, in terms of the distributions of the gradients and the weights. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm not privy to all the stuff that happens inside OpenAI, but at least in, in the kind of open source and academic communities, these techniques are not all being put together. You know, maybe they're just starting to be. You know, there was a couple of days ago a model created for the first time in open source that started to use this more continuous pre-training approach, and it did have dramatically better evals than anything else of its size. Yeah, so it's just, I, and I know, like, as well as the stuff that is in the literature, which I can see is not being used. I also, there's lots and lots of things in my own head, which I know are not being used because they're still in my head. So there's, we're just, we're barely scratching the surface of what's possible. Moving into 2024, what caution would you have in this new year or what excitement do you have around new models or AI in general? Anything that comes to mind when you think of 2024? Yeah, I hope we continue to see successful development of open source uh, foundation models. I feel like 2020 went a lot better than I thought it was going to at the start of the year. 
at the start of the year, there was a real push towards regulatory capture. I felt like the Overton window really shifted in a direction of like, oh yeah, regulatory capture is a necessary evil. And that's gone a lot better than it might have. You know, the, it seems like for the EU AI Act, it's not as bad as it could have been. Uh, it seems like the, you know, the stuff coming out, you know, with the US executive order was a lot less bad than it could have been. So I hope we kind of keep up this direction of like, increased openness, you know, and this is such a critical time for it because this is a time when all of society needs to be able to engage fully with with the technologies and with the policy implications and so forth, you know. Maybe something that would be nice to see this year, which I haven't seen yet, is to see more state-based, you know, serious approaches to try to create foundation models you know, for example, I don't think this will happen, but, you know, it'd be cool if Australia decided to create a foundation model. You know, I think, you know, I think, yeah, the more we have competitive flourishing, the more we have scientific open collaboration, these are all the things that I think are going to result in better outcomes for society at large and uh, avoid the kind of, the reason we created Fast AI and, and ran it entirely altruistically for years is my wife and I were worried about how AI could increase the distance between the haves and the have-nots. And so I, you know, I was worried, I still am worried about that happening even more now that AI is getting even better. So, you know, hopefully in 2024, we'll continue to see the kind of the conversation shift more towards, you know, flourishing for all and involvement of all. Yeah, that, that would make me extremely happy. Jeremy, I could listen to your thoughts about stuff for a very long time. I'm sad mm -hmm. that we only had an hour to chat with you today, but I, I really honestly feel like we, we had like three hours more worth of questions that we could have asked you. So this was wonderful. Thank you for the thank time. You, Logan. Um, thank you, Logan. Yes, thank you. Yeah, very this was an awesome conversation.